Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, on behalf of the scholarship across discipline committee, I would like to welcome all of you to this panel discussion on climate change, something that we all talk about all the time, especially after the Hurricane Sandy. Uh, we all know how, what a devastation we had all suffered from and climate is in fact affecting, climate change is affecting every part of the world and none of us are uh, immune to the dangers of the changes that, uh, uh, that may happen as a result of the climate change. This afternoon we have a distinguished panel of three professors from three, dif three different disciplines Actually, one of the things that we try to do in the Scholarship Across Discipline Committee is to bring faculty from diverse backgrounds who can share their research. And as a result, we come to know what people in other departments are doing. So anyway, this afternoon we have uh, Professor Christian Eggers, Assistant Professor of Biomedical Sciences with us. He's going to talk about climate change and spreading of new diseases, the case of the USA. Then we have Professor Don Johnson from the Department of Economics, and he's going to talk about the economic costs of climate change. And finally, we have Professor Greg Garvey, and Professor Greg Garvey is going to talk about climate change, is it real? And he's going to share some of his uh, own slides. He was also in Nepal, which is one of the worst affected area because of the global warming. And Professor Greg Garvey would conclude the discussion uh, professor Greg Garvey is a professor of the Department of Visual and Performing Arts. So before I invite the panelists to share their views, let me tell you about the format. Each panelist would talk for about uh, 15 minutes sharing their thoughts. After that, we will open the floor for question and answer, and we'll be spending about five minutes for Q&A. Then we'll go to the second panelist, then the third panelist. And once all the panelists uh, share their views, then we will again open the floor for question and answer. Uh, so I would request you that if you have any question, please hold your question until the end of the presentation by each panelist, and then you'll get a second chance at the end of all <coughs> the uh, uh, presentations. Oh, can I have a question? <laughs> you have already asked a question. So anyway, let me present before you Professor Christian Eggers from the Department of Biomedical Sciences. Thank you. I'm, I'm normally a really loud talker anyway, so giving me a microphone is a very dangerous, uh, dangerous thing. Um, so, as uh, Mohammed said, uh, I'm an assistant professor of biomedical sciences. Uh, I am a microbial pathogenesis person, uh, microbiologist. Um, my area of uh, study is actually um, the cause of agent of Lyme disease, Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, I, I have to say that there, because Lyme disease won't be figuring into uh, this discussion on climate change. Um, for whatever reason, tick-borne diseases don't seem to be um, as likely to be affected by climate change as uh, other infectious diseases, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, why that may be the case. Um, so. Uh, I, I, when we had originally planned this panel, um, I had thought that, that Greg might go first. For technical reasons, it became important that he go last. Um, he is going to present the evidence to convince you that climate change is happening, um, I hope. Otherwise, my talk is going to look really silly if he gets to the end and goes, oh, turns out it's not really true. Um, so, but uh, operating under the assumption that, uh, that, that um, uh, that, that climate change is, is actually occurring. It's not really an assumption. Operating with the evidence that climate change is occurring, um, I, I'm going to be discussing uh, spread of uh, infectious diseases. And, and saying that, um, we have to have an awareness that if you ask anyone, I could probably poll you in the audience right now, you would tell me, I'm sure that climate change affects infectious diseases. And, and, and we all have that in our head. Most um, professionals uh, have it in their head, microbiologists have it in their head, but as it turns out, as I delved deeper into uh, uh, the data for this topic, I realized that there's a lot of, of strong correlative data uh, that suggests that climate change could have an effect on the spread of infectious diseases, but the direct evidence um, uh, will require years more of gathering data. So, uh, and part of the reason that that is the case is that um, infectious diseases and their spread, which is uh, is uh, sort of illustrated here in the in the red center, uh, is is um, affected by many many different factors. 
one of which is, is uh, climate change and, uh, and variability. Um, but the others also play a significant role. And I'll, I'll give you an example of, of why sometimes it's not as clear cut about what is affecting, a, um, uh, what is affecting uh, the spread. Uh, recently in Europe, they had an outbreak of cholera, which was very unusual because cholera hasn't been seen um, uh, in Europe in, in, in quite some time, other than from people coming in already infected with cholera. This appears to have been a case of cholera acquired um, uh, uh, in, um, I think it was in Germany, um, and, and the uh, it, the reason why it was acquired is not clear. Was it somebody? Was it a human? Um, infected human who had migrated into the area and then contaminated a water source for a short period of time, or was it, um, or, or was it the fact that water, the water source was warming? due to climate change, and therefore Vibrio cholerae, which is a causative agent, is now endemic in that area. And, and so it's, it, or, or any other variety of reasons, why did cholera suddenly appear in Europe? You might say it's climate change, you might say it's something else. And so it's a, it's a very a multifactorial, um, uh, uh, there are a lot of factors that go into uh, the spread of infectious diseases. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about a little bit about why we think climate change will affect infectious disease spread and give you some examples where the evidence is pretty strong that climate change is playing a role um, but again uh, more data uh, is, is, is will be will be needed um, to say for sure I'm sure 50 years from now when somebody else is standing here I guess it could be me but maybe I hope not uh, well 50 years from now when somebody else is standing here and doing this same talk they may be able to uh, give you more direct evidence um, uh, about uh, this particular topic. First thing we need to do is clarify uh, the difference between climate and weather. Uh, so when we talk about climate, um, this is uh, what we expect based on historical data. So climate is a long-term um, uh, pattern of precipitation and drought and, and weather events and those things over hundreds if not thousands of years. Uh, and so, um, for instance, somebody may look out here and say, well, there's so much snow on the ground, how can climate change be real? The, what we are seeing there is weather. Weather is short term, which you actually get on a given day. It's it's a it's a blip that gets normed over hundreds of thousands of years, or you know tens to hundreds of years. In, in this case, since the climate change seems to be accelerated, but um, climate change is likely to affect the, uh, the spread of infectious diseases by infecting the distribution of infectious diseases. We expect infectious diseases to move from where we see them now to new areas of the globe in response to uh, changes in climate. Weather affects the timing and intensity of outbreaks of infectious diseases. So uh, we already had a mention of Hurricane Sandy, um, uh, certainly after Hurricane Katrina, after various monsoons and typhoons, other weather events, uh, we would expect um, uh, uh, a, a change in the infectious diseases that we see, normally an increase. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But both of these things can infect infectious diseases. We're looking at climate change with the understanding that ultimately the climate also dictates the weather. Uh, and so, again, tying into um, uh, potential effects uh, on uh, the spread of infectious diseases. Okay. We are all susceptible, I should say we are all, because we're all an outbred population, I hope. Um, uh, the, so we are all, or most of us are susceptible to every infectious disease that is out there barring some immunological deficiencies or various um, uh, uh, genetic diversities, we all are susceptible to malaria. Um, we get, uh, uh, if, if we travel to areas where malaria is currently found, we not only would get, we not only could get malaria, we could get a much more severe case of malaria than the people that live in those endemic areas. And I'm going to use that term a lot. Endemic is where um, a disease is normally found. It's, 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 uh, it's um, located there. It's not unexpected to get a disease uh, in that particular area. So we travel to an area where we get uh, where malaria is prevalent, we run the risk of getting it. But we don't generally get malaria. Uh, probably uh, only a small percentage of us in here may get malaria over the course of time or may even know uh, anybody who gets malaria over the course of our life. And, and, and um, the question is why? And so I only bring that up because when we talk about climate change, we're not actually talking about changing 
the relationship between the pathogen and the host. What we're talking about is changing um, the reservoirs that maintain those pathogens and the vectors or the, 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 the vehicles of transmission that allow those pathogens to move into us. And so um, our relationship with the pathogen is unlikely to be seriously changed by climate change, but the, um, uh, but the spread of the disease will. And so I need to talk about two different things, the reservoir and the methods of transmission. So. Where do pathogens come from? Well, they come from somewhere that they are. Um, and uh, uh, it just sounds redundant, but when we think about um, water reservoirs, these are pools of water that we maintain in order to allow us to use them um, uh, when we need them. Uh, pathogens have the same thing. There are reservoirs of infection where pathogens are maintained uh, and can then spread from those pools to uh, uh, humans or livestock of human concern. And there are three different types of reservoirs. There are human reservoirs, um, and that can be the person next to you who is exhibiting signs and symptoms of a disease and then spreads them to you, or it can be the person next to you that isn't exhibiting signs and symptoms of the disease but is infected with a pathogen and can still spread them to you, and they obviously are more concerned because you don't know they're sick, they don't know they're sick, but you can still get uh, uh, get the disease. There are animal reservoirs, um, shown here is uh, the scary picture of the raccoon, uh, which would be a reservoir for pathogens that cause rabies, uh, pathogens that cause leptospirosis, uh, and um, they can then transmit those uh, agents to us. And then there are non-living reservoirs, water, air, and food. Uh, and each of these may be affected in various ways by climate change. So let's say, for instance, a raccoon uh, may have a preferred area of living. Uh, and as, climate change, as the climate changes, that area may either shrink or expand, allowing raccoons to enter new areas and therefore possibly bringing rabies and leptospirosis into those areas with them. Uh, same thing with water. Water is actually uh, probably one of the, I'll, I'll use the word scariest, but um, one of the reservoirs of most concern because um, as water warms, it becomes much more hospitable to many of the pathogens that uh, might cause infectious disease. So if climate change results in warming water, um, we will uh, potentially see an increase in pathogens that come from um, our water source. And I've already mentioned uh, cholera, and I'll talk about uh, another example in just a minute. How do they get from, how do those pathogens get from the reservoirs to us? Um, I have to mention transmission. Contact, get bitten by that raccoon, have sex with an infected individual, you directly contact the reservoir of infection and get it that way. Vehicle, you ingest the air, food, or water. But what is of particular concern to us is actually the third mode of transmission, and this is um, arthropod vectors. So arthropods are insects and, and similar types of organisms. And they, um, arthropods are exquisitely sensitive to climate change. Uh, so whereas, um, uh, sorry, um, uh, whereas we are warm-blooded and sort of carry our environments with us, uh, arthropods are what we call poikilothermic, which is just a big word to say that they're the same temperature as the outside. And because of that, they are dictated that where they live, where they are endemic, where their range is, is dictated by the temperatures. We currently are lucky to be in an area where we don't deal with too many arthropods uh, because we've got long winters um, and, uh, and we have um, sort of varying uh, climate. But as the climate gets warmer and the winters get smaller, Arthropods uh, believe, will be, um, uh, can potentially move out of the areas where they currently are and into other areas. So arthropod vectors are of a big concern, and in fact, they're going to play heavily in a couple of examples that I'm going to talk about in a second, um, in, uh, uh, in uh, the spread of infectious diseases due to climate change. Uh, I'm not going to go over all these, but not every disease is likely to be uh, changed by climate change, at least not directly. Um, the sexually transmitted diseases will probably go on just as they uh, are now. Uh, maybe they might be affected by human migratory patterns due to climate change, but beyond that, um, uh, they probably will be the same 50 years from now as they are now. Uh, but there are a number of diseases which we have our eye on that may be changing um, in, response to, uh, in response to climate. Those that are waterborne, I've already mentioned. Those that are transmitted by arthropod vectors, I've already mentioned. Um, those that um, uh, arise as a result of weather-based disasters or conflicts over changing, diminishing resources, um, typhoid fever, epidemic typhus, those we may see more of as we uh, 
begin to readjust what resources we have available to us in response to climate change. And there's also significant evidence that over the time span of the globe uh, of Earth um, that um, uh, evolution has been closely tied to significant climate change. Um, when we look at those periods where we've had radiant evolution, meaning a number of different species um, have sort of arisen out of the record um, all at once, very often it's in response either to um, catastrophic um, uh, extinction events or climate change. And it should be pointed out that those sometimes are linked, um, uh, that the, the climate change actually is a catastrophic uh, uh, event um, in our global history. So um, that is those uh, we may be looking at perhaps new diseases in the future that have evolved as a result of uh, what we see now. Okay, so I just want to give a couple of examples of uh, infectious diseases that uh, are strongly correlated with um, what we are the climate change that we're experiencing now. Um, this is something I think you'll see a little bit more about later, but. I want to talk about it now. We don't necessarily think of infectious disease as, uh, as infecting coral, uh, but it turns out that um, uh, uh, coral bleaching has been occurring for quite a while. It's been uh, well demonstrated that it is due to in, uh, warming waters. Um, what you are looking at on your right um, is relatively healthy coral. This is coral that has um, an algae um, a symbiont that lives on it, and together they provide a, an amazing uh, environment for a uh, massive Massive amount of biodiversity, um, uh, and and uh, we're all aware of coral reefs and and uh, how exciting they can be. Anybody who's seen Finding Nemo. Uh, knows that. Um, then on uh, your left is bleached coral, and this is coral that has lost its algae, uh, its algae symbiont, um, and they are not hospitable places. Um, and, uh, and in fact, um, the, the reefs will die uh, as a result of this bleaching. And as I mentioned, it's, it's well um, documented that the bleaching occurs as a result of warming waters. Recent evidence suggests that at least in the case of um, the Oculina patagonica, the bleaching occurs because of the production of a single enzyme by a bacterial um, uh, symbiont that, that lives on these corals called uh, Vibrio chaloi. And Vibrio chaloi has an enzyme that is produced that kills the algae that then causes the bleaching of the coral. And that enzyme is temperature regulated. So what we have, in, what we have created is an environment where that enzyme is always on. If you cool down the water, the enzyme goes off and the coral ends up not being bleached, warm the water back up, the enzyme comes back and the algae dies. So what this means, and then the coral is bleached and is no longer effective, what this means is that coral bleaching is actually an infectious disease that is directly impacted by climate change. Um, and this is, uh, this probably is the best direct evidence we have that climate change will directly affect um, uh, uh, infectious diseases, even though again that's not of uh, humans. Moving a little bit closer to us, still haven't quite reached humans, but this is another um, good example. This gets back to the idea of the um, the vector and how important uh, its role is in the spread of infectious disease. This is the blue tongue virus, which I'm willing to bet that most of you have not heard of. It's frankly not uh, not something that um, you know on the tip of our tongue uh, to, to make a pun. Uh, but um, this, so BTV is a severe um, uh, hemorrhagic viral disease. Uh, it, it's subclinical in most livestock, but in a few um, uh, um, herds, it will end up causing a hemorrhagic disease, much like Ebola or Marburg. Might in uh, in humans, um, and it is transmitted by a vector, and the vector is the midge, which historically has been reflected uh, has been. Um, limited to the central part of Africa and then the central part of South America. And there's a midge up there, again, not to scale. It's not as big as a sheep's tongue, but it's it, uh, actually very, very small. Um, the midge now is known to be endemic uh, up in the Mediterranean basin. So by it, over the period of about seven years, it shifted from its African endemicity uh, all the way up to Italy, Greece, and France along the, the northern part of the Mediterranean. It's now endemic in uh, Europe, and they are seeing blue tongue virus outbreaks as a result. Um, again, it's not it's not 100% clear that climate change has resulted in this migration, but what is clear is that the midge is now taking advantage of an environment within that region that was not uh, heretofore um, available to it. And so um, we are also seeing this in the United States, um, particularly in the southern part of the United States, and, and again, this sort of uh, goes back to that idea that climate change leads to vector uh, migration and a change as a result of it. 
The, the last thing I'm going to uh, talk about then is um, the mosquito-borne diseases. So mosquitoes are considered to be the most likely, mosquito-borne diseases are considered to be the most likely to be directly affected by climate change. Mosquitoes are exquisitely tied into uh, the climate, both because of their own physiology, their replication cycle, um, uh, the, the wind patterns and things that will blow them around. So they are of significant concern as climate climate changes and areas become warmer, uh, it's, it's likely that mosquitoes uh, will spread and they transmit a lot of different diseases, malaria, yellow fever, dengue, um, all of the viral encephalitides, so western equine encephalitis, St. Louis equine encephalitis, um, uh, sorry, St. Louis encephalitis, um, uh, West Nile virus, uh, which I'll talk about uh, in just a second. There are over um, 3,000 species of mosquitoes, only a, 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 a limited number of them um, uh, transmit infectious diseases, but uh, they are of uh, uh, those obviously are of the, some concern to human health. This is a projection map. So um, this is of the dengue virus. Or, uh, yeah, this is the spread of the dengue virus um, uh, and, and its uh, associated mosquito uh, between uh, where it was in uh, 1990, where it um, was expected to be in 2085. At first glance, it might not look. Um, that serious, particularly for those of us that are uh, focused only on the United States. We look at this map and we go, well, you know, it doesn't really look like the United States is going to be any more affected. Uh, the first thing I'll point out is this is a 70-year projection. Climate change is long-term. What will this look like in 140 years, 210 years, so on? Um, we, if if, if um, the environment becomes right, we could see uh, dengue spread uh, throughout, uh, throughout the world. The other thing I'll point out is that if you look at um, the intensity, the number of cases of disease seen in even areas that have it now, they increase dramatically. So, um, and, and one of the things that, that, is, is, that seems to be true is that areas of the world that are struggling right now are going to struggle even more intensely because of climate change. And so this is, a, this is sort of that evidence. Areas of the world where they really can't, they can ill afford to have an increased burden of disease because of climate change, they will uh, likely experience uh, that increase. And in addition, then it may spread into areas where it uh, no longer, or where it uh, currently is not uh, not found. Um, West Nile is a good example of a disease that has uh, made its entry into the United States in recent history. 1999 was the first case in New York City. Um, West Nile did not come here because of climate change. Uh, it was carried, it appears to have been carried over on um, container ships from uh, the Middle East. Uh, the mosquito vector probably came with the virus in its mid-gut. Got here and went, holy cow, this is great. They've got all sorts of reservoir hosts. So horses and birds, you know, something that we have in abundance in West Nile um, the virus and the mosquito uh, that carry it can take advantage of, uh, can take advantage of it, and so. Um the uh, uh, in, so it's here now. It's endemic. In 2002, there was an outbreak. Um, 40 uh, 40 states reported cases. 4,000 people were affected. 15,000 horses. And when they went back and they looked at why that year was a particularly strong outbreak and why in other years there were particularly strong outbreaks, it turns out that it's associated with drought. So um, as climates change, as we get into more drought conditions in certain areas of the world, things like West Nile uh, will become uh, more common. Um, and again, uh, can infect uh, other places in the world, but also uh, we'll see that uh, in the United States. Last thing that I want to just sort of talk about is, uh, is sort of the future directions. Where do we go from here? How do we increase this linkage? We got to get the data, and it's going to take long-term uh, studies uh, to understand um, uh, what exactly this effect is. Uh, it's important not to assume that because you see an increase in cases, it's due to climate change. Um, there have been a uh, there's been a steady increase in cases of Lyme disease uh, in the United States over the last 20 years. Uh, but it, as I said at the beginning. Ticks are not as susceptible to climate change, and those cases seem to those increasing cases seem to be related to increasing human activities and surveillance. Uh, and so, don't um, don't ignore other factors that may be contributing to the spread just because you want to you want to blame it on uh, climate change. And then recognize that even if climate change is 
at the heart of the spread of diseases, there are still things that we can do to blunt their severity. So um, uh, modify human behavior, make appropriate vector controls widely available, um, develop safe and effective vaccines, and uh, which would be preferred, or medicines, which is less preferred because of potential for resistance, but if possible, and, and, and even if we do see a spread um, or we do see a significant increase in cases, we still may be able to um, uh, halt uh, uh, the worst effects, the worst burden on human health of uh, infectious diseases due to uh, climate change. Um, Greg is going to show this picture later as well. Um, uh, this is a 60-year difference between the one, the glaciers on uh, your left and uh, the, the now the uh, open body of water on the right. Um, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Eggers, for educating us uh, about how a warmer climate can quicken the spread of uh, infectious diseases. Uh, I really appreciate your sharing your uh, thoughts, even though some of them were really scary, I have to admit, <laughs> but it was very educational for us. Any question for Professor Eggers? What are microbiologists or other medical professionals uh, instead of waiting for decades of data to come, is there a professional push to um, make some of these changes now? To try to prevent? Um, I, I would like to say yes. I have not received that email myself. Um, no, I mean, I think that the, uh, I mean, it's, I guess the biggest thing is um, countries that have been sort of at the forefront of this research, like France, uh, and, and when I say this research, what I mean is research into diseases that has historically been um, locked, for lack of a better word, into um, developing countries as opposed to countries like the United States. Um, uh, They've stepped up their game. I mean, you know, we've, there's been a long search for vaccine uh, um, uh, uh, vaccines for malaria. There, are, you know, medications for malaria. Uh, there have been there have been many more attempts to um, kind of take the fight to 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 those areas of the world in terms of um, donating nets and even doing uh, limited DDT sprayings, those kinds of things, um, to control uh, mosquitoes. Um, but I think that. Uh, I, I'm not sure um, that we've been. I'm not sure that we've been convinced that, that that there's there's more to be done. I feel like if you ask an average medical professional, they'll say, "Oh yeah, we're trying to stop those diseases." I, I personally am not, but but somebody I'm sure is trying to stop those diseases. So I don't know that that clarion has been sounded. Uh, I think that that um, we as a as a profession tend maybe to point to the. The yeah, but maybe it's not climate change, so we should do this instead, and 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 things like that. So um, I, I like to think that there are are um, there's been a, a stepped up effort. Certainly, a lot of literature in the last five to ten years addressing this. They're holding meetings, you know, conferences on it now, whereas they weren't before. But um, I'm not sure how quickly that work will progress. Yes, I just put in a small plug. Uh, several years ago, a couple of us, about eight of us went to visit the Albert Schweitzer Hospital in Gabon. And uh, the original hospital building for a museum, but above it is a modern hospital built in Schweitzer style. And one of the activities of the Schweitzer Hospital there is malarial research. And in fact, it turned out the malarial drug that, and a malarial that we were given before we went uh, had been developed at the Schweitzer Hospital. So there's a small tie with uh, a local institute if people are interested, but you have to know French. <laughs> very nice, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Eggers. Now I would like to request my colleague from the Department of Economics, Professor Don Johnson, who is going to talk about the benefit-cost analysis of climate change. So I'm a, a theoretician, economists always are, and I really have to, to use the theory foundation, I guess, to explain why I think we've, we've had a difficult time dealing with uh, with what's even an obvious problem to economists. Economists talk about something called public good. And a public good has two characteristics. It's a non-rival good, non-excludable good. Non-rival simply explained as many people can use the good at the same time without reducing the amount available for anybody else. Uh, 
So if you use a pair of shoes, that's not a public good. Uh, I use that pair, you can't use the same pair at the same time. But cleaning up the environment would be a public good because we would all benefit from it at the same time without reducing the amount available for anybody else. The non-exclusion characteristic actually is what probably poses us more problems because once a public good has been provided, you can't keep people from using it. Well, in this particular context, the problem is something that we refer to as a free rider. So suppose we wanted to deal with climate change, global warming, and some countries do this. Whatever benefits come from that, other countries that don't participate in that behavior would also be able to benefit from that. So when you think about that for a second, in other words, if I do nothing and they do something, I benefit and there's no cost on my end. You reach a very quick conclusion. There's a strong incentive not to participate, to let somebody else do this. And I think in many respects that's the biggest problem on an international scale with dealing with this problem that people, countries in this case, will act as free riders and hope that others will do something. And when you look at it, uh, particularly, some of the countries that are biggest polluters are obviously countries like ourselves. So we certainly have, in a sense, some incentive to clean up, but it's also gonna cost us the most because we are the ones creating the most gases. We are the largest producer. So from our standpoint, we have an incentive to clean up, but we also have an incentive not to clean up because of the cost. But what we've been particularly worried about over time is competitiveness. So we've had a difficult time agreeing with, with <coughs> some of the major uh, undertakings we've taken on an international scale to try to deal with these problems. And the problem has been we're worried about our competitiveness in this sense. We do something about the problem. This is going to cost us. If other countries don't participate, what's the first thing we'll lose? And the answer is jobs to other countries that don't participate. So the biggest polluter in this case, the bigger, biggest cause of all the problem has one of the stronger incentives not to participate because we're worried about farming out jobs. And you've been listening to this for the last how many years since the economy has turned down. Try to get the U.S. to go along with a policy like this when the first thing they're worried about is farming out jobs to other countries. And again, comes back to the free rider problem. Now you take this one more step and we have what economists would describe as externalities and again two characteristics. An externality would be a benefit or a cost that's not accounted for in a transaction. So again when you buy a pair of shoes the only person that benefits is you and the cost is yours in terms of buying but also the, country, the company that's producing it bears the entire <coughs> cost of producing. But if while you're producing, you pollute and you don't bear that cost, we would refer to that as an external cost, a cost that you can shift on to other people in terms of lower environmental quality or whatever the particular case may be. Okay, so when you have an externality problem like this, it gets very complex in this, in this particular case because you can think of it as sort of on two levels, a spatial level and a time level. Because who are we imposing the externality on? Well, if we have global warming, we're not so, most, so much imposing the externality upon ourselves as we're imposing it on future generations. Okay. Spatially, the problem also gets pretty complex because the largest emitters, again, emitters, countries like ours, uh, also have the largest capacity to reduce the emissions. So in a sense, we're probably not expected to deal with as much damage. At the same time, it's easier for us to clean it up than other less developed countries on an economic scale. Uh, at the same time, we're the ones causing the biggest problem in terms of the total amount of pollution that's created. So when you put these two problems together, what are the implications? Well, one implication is the market economy is not gonna deal with the problem. They're gonna try to shift the costs on to others, not bear the costs themselves. And even at a country level, it's difficult to get governments to do anything about the problem. The result is probably an inefficient solution, less cleanup than we would expect otherwise. It also points out that it's very difficult to get inter any kind of international agreement in this case. Uh, it's necessary to deal with the problem, but exceedingly difficult because of the nature of this public good and externality problem. So what do you do? Well, again, you come back to this issue that the benefits from the cleanup tend to be backloaded. In other words, if you deal with the problem, it's not so much we gain from this as future generations gain from this. 
But who pays the cost? And at least initially, it's going to be us paying the cost. It reduces the incentive to deal with the problem. I mean, most people are not altruistic in most cases. So in a situation like this where I'm not directly benefiting from it, but I'm bearing the cost, I would just assume do nothing. Um, now that probably exaggerates uh, the degree of, of the problem, but it points out the problem trying to deal with this on an economic level. Economists tend to look at any problem from a standpoint of what are the benefits, what are the costs of the problem. And our standard approach, at least in terms of efficiency, would be what we would refer to as maximizing present value of the net benefits. Simply put, you take your benefits, subtract your cost, you have a stream over time, you discount that stream back to present value. Well, the problem with applying that approach in this case, it's inherently biased against future generations who have no say in what we're doing. We're making the decision, but we're impacting them. We're imposing costs on them down the road, and they have no say in what the benefits are from this. So right away, in terms of applying the benefit-cost approach, one of your problems is going to be, how do you estimate the benefits? How can you get a truthful answer on this? You've got a free rider problem. You've got a problem where the benefits are extended out into the future from the cleanup, and we don't know what they are, so we're making decisions for the people in the future. And you immediately see that it's very difficult to obtain the information. You've got an ethical issue. We're damaging them, and they have no say in what we do about it directly. So, one of the approaches that I've seen used, at least recommended in recent years, is a wait and see approach. And when you think of that initially, you think of that as a fairly conservative approach, a somewhat risk averse approach, and I would argue it's actually a risk seeking approach. Uh, because it's essentially a do nothing. Well, we're not certain what's going to happen. There's a great deal of uncertainty in terms of benefits and costs, who receives them and how much. So we'll wait, and we'll get a better idea of how bad this problem is, if there's a problem that's that severe before we do anything. And again, I would argue that's not actually a risk-averse approach, it's a risk-seeking approach. Because if you don't do anything and you're wrong about this, you're imposing horrendous costs in the future, and you don't have to bear that cost. And yet that has been the general approach that I've seen <laughs> most often described as, well, we're not sure, so we'll wait. Uh, yet, to me, it's a very risky approach, and I think actually from a best strategy standpoint, we'd be better off doing modest reductions now. Um, part of the reason for that, again, goes back to the timing of this, that if you don't do anything now and you're wrong, and you have to clean up a lot in the future, the costs are going to be very high, and you're going to have to act very quickly to be able to deal with the problem. So the wait and see approach somewhat backloads the cost, but it also may increase the cost. Whereas if you did something up front, if you started modest reductions in terms of reducing emissions at this point, even though the problem may be worse than we think later, at least we've got to start on this and we don't have to act as fast to the same degree in the future. Now, one of the concerns Okay, one of the, the approaches that was originally talked about, and it, I found it interesting, I teach environmental economics, I talked a lot about pollution taxes in the course, yet it's a, an approach to dealing with pollution problems that this country basically has never used and refused to use. And what are the potential advantages or disadvantages of this? Europe in particular, when we first start, started talking about this on an international scale, wanted to go with basically a carbon tax, or so it's been called, which is a tax on pollution. And the idea is that as you pollute, you'll pay us for the pollution that you undertake. From my standpoint, it certainly changes behavior because it imposes a cost upon firms and they're going to want to reduce the amount of pollution to avoid the taxes. Another advantage to it, from my standpoint as an economist, is it raises revenue. And one of the things I always liked about this approach, and I always talk about this in class, is if you raise revenue from this, what are you going to do with it? I mean, if you want to help the poor with the revenue you raise from cleaning up for the environment, okay, noble cause, fine. If you want to invest some money in research and development to clean up the environment more, fine. But at least you've got revenue from the, the process and the people that are causing the damage of the polluters and the people that are buying the products are actually going to be paying for what they do. Well, 
it's a reasonable approach. It's a popular approach in Europe. It hasn't been used here, and we were the ones that particularly raised concerns about this. One of the concerns we raised, and other countries did, did, because when you did this on an international scale, it was more difficult than a national scale, was who would control the revenue. In other words, we're paying into this fund, and if we don't control it, it may not be used the way we want it to be used. So that was one of the criticisms raised. And another criticism, is, and it's a standard one with this approach, is the firms were worried about it because it imposes a financial burden on them. Now, as an economist, I wouldn't say I'm not worried about that, but I've always taken the attitude that if, if you're the one causing the harm and you compensate us for that harm you're causing, that seems to be a reasonable approach. But it's been a very tough sell in this country. And if you take it another step, the real complaint, and I think the U.S. was the biggest complainer here, was, was the competitiveness issue. So we imposed a tax, and the U.S. being one of the biggest polluters would immediately be paying a large sum in taxes or fees as a result of this. And the first thing we started worrying about again was jobs. Well, it would raise the cost of our producers. It would give people incentives to buy products from other countries. It would give us an incentive from a producing level of shipping jobs out of the country. And so the U.S. tried very, very hard, you might say, to sort of torpedo the tax idea even though I think it, it has a lot of merit, and particularly from the revenue-raising standpoint, this would be a massive fund that you could use to fund all sorts of R&D to try to find ways to clean up the environment more effectively and cheaper. Uh, yet we, again, don't use this approach, and the competitiveness issue, I think, was the one that finally shot it down. So where did we move? Well, we moved to the term you've probably heard at some point, the cap and trade, and Certainly one, uh, one advantage of this approach is you get certainty that you have a limit on the amount of pollution, that you allow flexibility in this system. I mean, it has the potential to be cost effective um, and that you can sell pollution permits to others uh, who have higher cleanup costs than you do. Um, in other words, make a profit on this. And so firms have tended to prefer this approach because it's at least potentially profitable to them to sell permits. Uh, the cap-and-trade approach, I would say, is not exactly perfect. I mean, it has its problems. I point out a couple at the end. One fundamental problem, and it's always true in these, is monitoring and enforcing these policies. But another one, we had, we had an odd thing happen. If you truly understand global warming, you realize that the more you produce, the more residuals you're going to produce, and the more global warming you're going to create. So if your economy slows down, what happens to global warming? Well, it slows down because you don't produce as many goods and you don't sell as many goods. So we had an odd thing happen in terms of timing that in Russia and Ukraine, their economies slowed down tremendously at one time. As a result, they were producing less emissions than they were before, which enabled them, interestingly, to sell these emission permits to other countries, other producers, but at the same time not clean up as much as they would have otherwise. And so people view that as somewhat, a, as a, it's sort of an odd loophole, I guess you might say, in a system like this. I'm not sure I'm not worried about it because if you have less pollution from this, then in the end that's probably a good thing. But if I sort of summarize this, it's almost impossible to work out these international agreements because of the, the free rider problem related to public goods and the externality problem. So you're going to have to come up with a system where you create some incentives to try to get people to negotiate. And I suggest as an idea, and part of this I think is my frustration with the U.S. that sort of opted out of, of the Kyoto Protocol. Um, the biggest producer of pollution in the world is the one that, that says we're not interested in being part of this and making these decisions. If we could create linkages in this case where we could simultaneously, and Professor Elahi probably could do this more eloquently than I can, but if we really looked at this as an international cooperation where you try to deal with the pollution problem at the same time as trade agreements, you're going to, have pe you're going to give people a stronger incentive to opt in. If you try to deal with these things independently, if you try to deal just with the pollution problem, the first thing that's going to happen is you've got a public good problem, you've got a free rider problem, and people <coughs> are going to free ride, not participate, and it'll tend to fall apart. If you can put the trade agreements together at the same time as you do with the pollution problem, you're going to give them an incentive to stay within the group as opposed to let everybody else deal with the problem. 
Um, and you know, just as a suggestion, I have it in a little bit smaller type. But if you could get the ratifiers of the agreements to only uh, or to agree to only share the the R and D, as it were, from this, the ways to clean up the environment with the people that participate, you give people a stronger incentive to participate in the process. Um, if you could create a system, at least one that was acceptable to the group where the gainers from this could compensate the losers from this, you would have an easier time keeping the groups together. But the bottom line of this is it's a public good on a massive scale with a massive free rider problem. And again, it's all economic jargon, but I'm a theoretician, that's where I go with this. And as a result of those things, you need to create an incentive system that brings people in rather than gives them an incentive to opt out because people will act in their self-interest, whether it's on their own level or on a national level, and the incentive for the most part is to opt out, and we've sadly, to some degree, been one of the opt-out parties, even though we're the worst offender of the bunch. So, I'll end there. Thank you. Any question for Professor Johnson? Okay, I have a question uh, and, and a comment, actually. First, I would make a comment. A few years ago, when I was in Costa Rica, I saw firsthand the benefit of carbon tax. The European companies, uh, which had to pay carbon tax to their governments, they could reduce their tax by planting trees, because that offsets carbon emission. Mm -hmm. And in Europe, there is not much space left to plant trees. So they were giving money to NGOs and governments in many Latin American and Central American countries where they were planting trees. And many areas that were deforested in the last few years, they were again reforested with European uh, contribution. So that was a good example that I saw how carbon tax works. So that's just a comment. And I also had a question for you. And this question is from a developing country perspective. One of the arguments that many developing countries use against the developed countries is that the developed countries, they are already industrialized. They have been polluting the environment for hundreds of years. Now they have moved to the service economy, but we are at the manufacturing uh, economy, that, that base, and we want to be developed. If there is carbon tax or some other measures to curb emission, we will not be able to become uh, economically more uh, affluent. So you are stopping us from becoming economically developed. So how do we answer those criticisms? You don't. They're right. <laughs> they are. I mean, it's, it's People in this country have no idea how well off they are compared to the rest of the world. And we've taken advantage of the natural resources of the world for the last 100 years and left them in exactly that situation. And there is no way they can get to where we are. They can't because there are not enough resources on this planet for everybody to produce at the level of the U.S. So we can simply take what we have and say you're out of luck. Um, or we start to talk about sharing a little bit, and that goes back to the gainers and the losers argument. Why would they bother to opt into this when they can free ride? We do nothing and nothing happens. We need to create an incentive to get them in. And we have the wealth to do it, but so far we've been unwilling. And I, I understand we're in the slowdown in the economy and tough for college students to get a job now relative to the where it was a few years ago, but they still have no idea how good they've got it compared to the rest of the world. Um, and unless we give some on this, this will fall apart. Um, and even economists understand the problem is there. I mean, I, don't, I can't imagine people will want to sit there with blinders on and say, well, the scientific evidence isn't there anymore. It's an incredibly risk-seeking strategy down the road when the evidence is becoming clear-cut to almost all the scientists in the world. And I guess, like always, you can find somebody that agrees with your opinion, but, but uh, I think the preponderance of evidence is there, and it's time for the developed countries to start to look at ways to find to bring them in, and one of them may be to, comp to compensate. Uh, I talk about it a little bit environmental economics. You know, we're always worried about deforestation around the world. And I'm sitting here saying, you're looking at some of the poorest people in the world cutting down a few trees to survive, and you're worried about the impact on climate and the value to you of the climate. Well, part of the reason why you have a 
the high value to cleaning up the environment is because you're, you're so wealthy compared to the rest of the world. They have a low value because they don't have the wealth to pay for it. So, and I actually agree with the first thing you said too. I've, I've been for carbon taxes for a long time, whatever sort of environmental taxes is a way to deal with these problems in part because they do raise revenue and, you, and the people that pay are the ones causing the damage. I, I see it on an ethical level, I see it on a revenue raising level but we've never been willing to do it because the, you know, I'm in a business school, so heading for trouble here, but because the business community has never, never been willing to go along with these, um, and we cave on a political level. When I think for many of these problems, it's a better, a better way to deal with them um, than what we've used in the past, which is standards, thou shalt not pollute or thou shalt pollute a certain amount, which has been a very inefficient approach. And that's my whole environmental course. If you get me going on this, we'll be here for the rest of the semester and we'll be talking about environmental. No, thank you very much. Now let me present before you our last panelist, Professor Greg Garvey, and his title is Seeing is Believing. Thank you, uh, Mohammed. <laughs> my co-presenters, really intriguing presentations. Uh, I wanted to start with asking some simple questions. What do we know? What can we believe, and then drag in a philosopher, Thomas Nagel, who articulates what is an extreme form of skepticism, of which could be called solipsism, that you know nothing beyond your own mind. And that really is against the backdrop of everything we've been talking about. How do we know what's happening? So let's ask the really big question, in terms of cosmological issues. And um, the Higgs boson was recently discovered, and or maybe the Higgs boson. And here is an image of a track that shows the, uh, the results of the particle uh, acceleration at CERN. And the traces are mu, are the collision of two protons and the decay into four muons, and that is an indirect evidence of the existence of the Higgs boson. So we accept this, I suppose, on faith. And Joseph Lycan, a theoretical physicist, then jumps to this conclusion. Maybe the universe we live in is inherently unstable. And some point billions of years from now, it's all going to get wiped out. And of course, this was carried in the press as scientists predict the end of the universe. Um, and how do we go from our immediate experience to such a conclusion? And I would argue for what we might call faith-based science. We have faith in science and its methodology that allows us to embrace such a conclusion. So, of course, we jump to the end times. On our broadcast tonight, melting away, there is new and dramatic evidence of what's happening to our world, melting ice and rising seas at record levels. And tonight, we'll look at the impact already being felt. From NBC News World Headquarters in New York, this is NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams. Good evening. At a time when so many people are still suffering, right now, tonight, more than one month after a monster storm hit a giant population center, today we learn some facts about how this earth is changing and how fast. For starters, polar ice sheets in Greenland are melting at five times the pace of just a few years ago. New research concludes that Antarctica is melting. While it takes a lot of ice to melt to raise ocean levels, they say that is in fact happening. And they believe just an incremental recent rise of ocean levels made the damage worse when Hurricane Sandy hit the East Coast and took so much away from us. The big question mark is the future, of course, and a new kind of normal for all those living along the water. It's where we begin here tonight. Our chief environmental affairs correspondent, Ann Thompson, is here with us. And Ann, how did we learn all of this today? Well, the information comes from a group of international scientists, Brian, and it shows that we are living climate change in real time. 
Growing zones in this country are moving north. This July was the warmest month on record. And tonight there is new information that reveals just how fast the world's ice sheets are melting. The numbers are staggering. Oh! 344 billion metric tons of ice melting in Antarctica and Greenland a year. The weight of more than a million Empire State Buildings. The alarming findings published today in the journal Science from a team of international researchers who looked at the data gathered over the last 20 years, creating what they say is the most accurate picture of melting. In Antarctica, the east region is gaining ice, but it's not enough to make up for the loss on the rest of the continent. In Greenland, a record 97% of the ice sheet thawed this July, as shown here in red. Today, it is losing ice five times faster than in the early 1990s. The faster speeds that we're seeing uh, in Greenland are not going to slow down. That's not the way uh, ice sheets behave. The melting accounts for 20% of sea level rise in the past two decades, according to the study, adding 11 millimeters. It doesn't sound like much until you consider it's like pouring in more than 26 Lake Tahoes. Antarctica and Greenland are the vastest reservoirs of ice on the planet. All told, they hold hundreds of feet of sea level rise. And that's the worry. Many of the world's cities are in the crosshairs. Most of the people around the world live in coastal areas. It's where most of your major cities are because that's where ports are. And they are at sea level. So even small changes in sea level rise can displace millions of people. Look at what could happen to cities on the East Coast. This could be the impact of five feet of sea level rise. This is 25 feet, which some experts say could happen in just a few centuries. Today, New Jersey and New York are still recovering from the punishing effect of Sandy, a storm fueled by higher seas. In Greenland, photographer Jim Baylog used time-lapse cameras to record the melting five years ago. I want to show people the reality of what's happening. You know, what he found me, here so and around the world is now the subject of the documentary Chasing Ice. Oh my God. The net effect is that more ice is going into the ocean as it's speeding up. Confirmed by the results of today's study. So it was more than 10 years ago that Al Gore produced an inconvenient truth and it was much attacked and derided by various uh, different parties and uh, we're going to watch a little bit of the big engine for redistributing heat from the equator to the poles and it does that by means of ocean currents and wind currents they tell us the scientists do that the earth's climate is a nonlinear system just a fancy way they have of saying that the changes are not all just gradual. Some of them come suddenly in big jumps. On a worldwide basis, the annual average temperature is about 58 degrees Fahrenheit. If we have an increase of five degrees, which is on the low end of the projections, look at how that translates globally. That means an increase of only one degree at the equator, but more than 12 degrees at the pole. So uh, this is from a right-wing blog uh, attacking uh, Al Gore and stating that there is, of course, exaggeration. Um, and uh, in 2009, 31,500 scientists, dissenting scientists, signed a petition against the belief that global warming is man-made. But let's put that in perspective of the total almost 13 million scientists in the United States, that represents 0.24% of the entire scientific community. If you look to the lower right, you see one figure upside down with a little gray head. Here's another way of analyzing that same information that, uh, and I think the more significant result is the percentage of publishing climatologists who disagree. It's 1%. So what this points to is that there is a consensus. And here is uh, data on temperature changes reported from multiple organizations, NASA, NOAA, and the Japanese Meteorological Agency. And you can see that they all converge in the same, towards the same mean. And um, now I betray my position which I think that we, we have a serious challenge and we need to do something. 
And this also, I think you would address this, Don, in your talk, that it's, um, there are positive results if we act now, and the possibility that things will be much worse and will cost much, much more to mitigate perhaps trumps the argument of doing nothing. And of course, there has been a lot of disinformation for all sorts of, shall we call it, people acting in their self-interest or companies acting in their self-interest. It is Bill McKibben who probably is on the front lines of the battle for, uh, against and controlling uh, climate change. And he wrote this book, The End of Nature, and he has found an organization called 350.org. And we finally have a number to crisply express our peril. Before the Industrial Revolution, the atmospheric concentration of carbon in the atmosphere was 275 parts per million, plus or minus 10 parts per million for all the 10,000 years of the Holocene. So depending on your predilection, that's the Genesis number, the Buddha number, the Shakespeare number, the, that's the world from which we came. Okay? On comes the Industrial Revolution, we begin to burn coal and gas and oil, that number begins to mount, but we never know just where the red line is, and given human nature, we always hope that it's a little further out in the distance so we can get to this problem and deal with it, or really rather so that our children can get to this problem and deal with it, and we won't have to. But when the Arctic melts, that tells you that you may have crossed this line already. And in fact, after that sequence of events, many of our best scientists went back to work. An American team led by James Hansen at NASA and his colleagues, really our foremost climatologists, published a paper in January of 2008 that gave us a number. And that number, and it's the most important number on the planet, though we never knew it till 18 months ago, was 350 parts per million CO2. Any number greater than that, they said, in the abstract of a peer-reviewed scientific paper, was not compatible with the planet upon which civilization developed or to which life on Earth is adapted. Strong language and a very strong number, especially strong when you consider that we're already past it. We're at 387 parts per million and we are... So. That is the number that we're well beyond, and more recently it, we're at 392 parts per million. And this graph, and I'm going to speed it up a little bit, shows you the change over the last 30 years. And here we go up to January 2011, 391 parts per million. And here's the film that actually was, I believe it won an Academy Award uh, on Sunday night. And now, one bit of science before we get into the visuals. If everybody in the developed world understood this graph and emblazoned it on the inside of their foreheads, there would be no further societal argument about climate change because this is the story that counts. Everything else you hear is just propaganda and confusion. Key issues. This is a 400,000 year record. This exact same pattern is seen going back now almost a million years before our current time. And several things are important. Number one, temperature and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere go up and down basically in sync. You can see that from the orange line and the blue line. Nature naturally has allowed carbon dioxide to go up to 280 parts per million. That's the natural cycle. Goes up to 280 and then drops for various reasons that aren't important to discuss right here. But 280 is the peak. Right now, if you look at the top right part of that graph, we're at 385 parts per million. We are way, way outside the normal natural variability. Earth is having a fever. In the past 100 years, the temperature of the Earth has gone up uh, 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit, 0.75 degrees Celsius. And it's going to keep going up because we keep dumping fossil fuels into the atmosphere at the rate of about two and a half parts per million per year. 
It's been a remorseless, steady increase. We have to turn that around. That's the crux. And someday I hope to emblazon that across Times Square in New York and a lot of other places. But anyway, off to the world of ice. We're up at the Columbia Glacier in Alaska. This is a view of what's called the calving face. This is what one of our cameras saw over the course of a few months. And you see the glacier flowing in from the right, dropping off into the sea, camera shooting every hour. If you look in the, in the middle background, you can see the calving face bobbing up and down like a yo-yo. That means that glacier is floating and it's unstable and you're, going, you're about to see the consequences of that floating. To give you a, a, a little bit of a sense of scale, that calving face in this picture is about 325 feet tall. That's 32 stories. This is not a little cliff. This is like a major office building in an urban center. The calving face is the wall where the visible ice breaks off. But in fact, it goes down below sea level another couple thousand feet. So there's a wall of ice, a couple thousand feet deep, going down to bedrock if, it's, if the glacier is grounded on bedrock and floating if it isn't. Here's what Columbia has done. This is in south central Alaska. This was an aerial picture I did one day in June, three years ago. This is an aerial picture we did this year. That's the retreat of this glacier. The main stem, the main flow of the glacier is coming from the right, and uh, it's going very rapidly up that stem. We're going to be up there in just a few more weeks, and we expect that it's probably retreated another half a mile, but if I, if I got there and discovered that it had collapsed and it was five miles further back, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised. Now, it's really hard to grasp the scale of these places because as the glaciers, one of the things is that places like Alaska and Greenland are huge. They're not normal landscapes. And as the, but as the glaciers are, are retreating, they're also deflating, like air is being let out of a balloon, right? And so there are features on this landscape. There's a ridge right in the middle of the picture up above where that arrow comes in that uh, shows you that a little bit. There's a marker line called the trim line above our little red uh, illustration there. This is something no self-respecting photographer would ever do. You put some cheesy illustration on your shot, right? And uh, yet you have to do it sometimes to narrate these points. But in any case, the deflation of this glacier since 1984 has been uh, uh, higher than the Eiffel Tower, higher than the Empire State Building. A tremendous amount of ice has been let out, out of these valleys as it's retreated and deflated, gone back up valley. These changes in the alpine world are accelerating. It's not static. Particularly in the world of sea ice, the rate of natural change is outstripping predictions of just a few years ago, and the processes either are accelerating or the predictions were too low to begin with. But, but in any case, there are big, big changes happening as we speak. So here's another time-lapse shot of Columbia. And you see where it ended in these various spring days, June, May, then October. Now we turn on our time lapse. This camera was shooting every hour. Geologic process in action here. And everybody says, well, don't they advance in the wintertime? No, it was retreating through the winter because it's an unhealthy glacier. Finally catches up to itself, it advances. And you can look at these pictures over and over again because there's such a strange, bizarre fascination in seeing these things you don't normally get to see come alive. I mean, we've been talking about seeing as believing and seeing the unseen at this uh, TED Global. That's what you see with these cameras. The images make the uh, invisible visible. These huge crevasses open up, these great ice islands break off. And now watch this. This has been the springtime this year. Huge collapse. That happened in about a month, the loss of all that ice. So it was James Hansen who wrote uh, two important papers, one in 1981, a follow-up in 1988, and this is his prediction from 1988, and he's describing what we're living through now. What do I know that would cause me, a reticent Midwestern scientist, to get myself arrested 
in front of the White House protesting. And what would you do if you knew what I know? In 1981, we published an article in Science Magazine concluding that observed warming of 0.4 degrees Celsius in the prior century was consistent with the greenhouse effect of increasing CO2. That Earth would likely warm in the 1980s, and warming would exceed the noise level of random weather by the end of the century. We also said that the 21st century would see shifting climate zones, creation of drought-prone regions in North America and Asia, erosion of ice sheets, rising sea levels, and opening of the fabled Northwest Passage. And he was right. Now, I just want to go back to philosophy. And Karl Popper is a philosopher of science. And he points out that science does not give us absolute knowledge, rather it is tentative. And you can make corroborations to other tentative statements. So in the realm of all possible worlds, it's possible that our current knowledge could be falsified. But it appears to be highly unlikely. Um, and let's just take a look at some graphs showing that um, Temperatures are definitely getting warmer, and um, we have a huge problem with carbon dioxide emissions worldwide. China now, there is even later data from this year showing that China now uh, contributes as much as all other countries combined, which is an astonishing uh, figure. Another figure I heard is that they're building a coal-fired plant every week. So there's a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide that's being dumped in. And that gets back to the issue that Mo asked about how do, when the other countries want to catch up, China is catching up. Climate change deniers argue that the sun is the main cause of climate change. But the measured energy imbalance occurred during the deepest solar minimum in the record, when the sun's energy reaching Earth was least. Yet, there was more energy coming in than going out. This shows that the effect of the sun's variations on climate is overwhelmed by the increasing greenhouse gases, mainly from burning fossil fuels. Now consider Earth's climate history. These curves for global temperature, atmospheric CO2, and sea level were derived from ocean cores and Antarctic ice cores, from ocean sediments and snowflakes that piled up year after year, over 800,000 years, forming a two-mile-thick ice sheet. As you see, there is a high correlation between temperature, CO2, and sea level. Careful examination shows that the temperature changes slightly lead the CO2 changes by a few centuries. Climate change deniers like to use this fact to confuse and trick the public by saying, look, the temperature causes CO2 to change, not vice versa. But that lag is exactly what is expected. Small changes in Earth's orbit that occur over tens to hundreds of thousands of years alter the distribution of sunlight on Earth. When there is more sunlight at high latitudes in summer, ice sheets melt. Shrinking ice sheets make the planet darker, so it absorbs more sunlight and becomes warmer. A warmer ocean releases CO2, just as a warm Coca-Cola does. And more CO2 causes more warming. So CO2, methane, and ice sheets were feedbacks that amplified global temperature change, causing these ancient climate oscillations to be huge, even though the climate change was initiated by a very weak forcing. The important point is that these same amplifying feedbacks will occur today. The physics does not change. As Earth warms, now because of extra CO2 we put in the atmosphere, ice will melt, and CO2 and methane will be released by warming ocean and melting permafrost. While we can't say exactly how fast these amplifying feedbacks will occur, it is certain they will occur. So one of the big issues, once again, going back to what do we know, what do we believe, is that we're dealing with scales of time that exceed 
sort of the political windows of opportunity. There is evidence that feedbacks are already beginning. So I'm just going to show you quickly, we saw these images before of what occurred last summer. That means that ice was melting all across Greenland and in the interior where the ice sheet is at its thickest. I think it's over like two and a half miles thick. Um, this shows what's happening in Antarctica. Here is from NASA showing the diminution of the Arctic uh, coverage, sea ice. And as we get closer to the present moment, you can see that the extent is contracting. Fora TV, the world is thinking. So, in fact, let's take a look at a chart from the IPCC where it's predicting what, uh, how soon this summer ice in the Arctic is going to melt. So this is uh, from the starting point, 100% means there would be no ice left in the Arctic. And they predicted that basically around 2080, about 2100, all the ice would melt. But in reality, uh, the ice is melting very quickly. It's about half gone now, and it's going to be all gone in the next five or 10 years. So there are dire consequences worldwide. There were fires across Australia in the American Southwest this past summer, in R Russia two years ago. There is the die-off of major forests because the pine beetle survives the winter because the winters are milder. And once the, there is the die-off, of course, these forests are more prone to fire. And there is the loss of habitat of various species. And that's something else that is going to occur, is we're going to have species collapse. And there is also the impacts on, the on of islands in the Lies Pacific. low-lying atolls called the Carterets. But what should have been an idyllic South Pacific paradise is rapidly turning into a climate change disaster site. And another is Tuvalu. I'm going to skip this. And of course, it's having impacts. At nearly 9,000 meters above sea level, the highest places this in the is world. the highest point on Earth. And the retreat. Tibetan monks believe that mountain goddesses protect Mount Everest and the other peaks in the region. He goes on to explain that... As you can see on the satellite picture, the Aral Sea ultimately broke into three pieces, and now the biggest one of those, the southeastern chunk, has completely dried up. But all told, you're talking about at least 90, probably 95% of the surface area of the lake. It's just gone. So, just to conclude, um, acidification is impacting uh, the oceans and the formation of uh, sea life. And here's an example of uh, shellfish. But there's a, lucky for us here in New England, um, it actually causes an increase in the growth rate of lobsters. So we have something to look forward to. And of course, this explains here is the bleaching of the coral, which was, and also there is the Amazon deforestation. This points to human interaction, aside from simply uh, the production of carbon dioxide. And this shows the process of deforestation in the lungs of the world uh, in the Amazon. And uh, the, this sh shows the destruction of ancient forests, and only about 20% of the world's large ancient forests remain intact. So I think that um, I'm just going to, um, by the way, this is the uh, Canadian tar sands, and this is how the mining operation goes. And it's bitumen, it's one of the dirtiest types of sources for oil, and this is what uh, Bill McKibben and James Hansen have been putting uh, themselves on the line for. 
to stop the Keystone Pipeline. And it is in their opinion that if this resource is extracted, it will push us well beyond the tipping point and we'll never recover. And I think I probably should stop at this point. So, thank you very much, Professor thank Darwin. You. We still have time for one or two questions. So if you have any question for Professor Garvey, please feel free to ask. <laughs> I wanted to address a few of your previous uh, uh, points in, in terms of economics. But uh, you had stated that you felt the jobs would uh, end up overseas uh, in terms of uh, a shift in the regulations of the carbon I'm sort of, I'm sort of following your logic, and, and I can see some of it. But if we I do thought so. that because of the lack of regulations for a lot of the pollution, and a lot of these jobs have ended up in China because they're they're not trying to. Uh, you it's know, it's sort of that. If we do something and they don't, we'll raise our costs, and that'll that'll result in less purchases of our goods. If it raises the cost of businesses, they'll be looking for somewhere else to produce at a lower cost, and that could result in the export of jobs. Now you can you can get there by saying they have no regulations at all, and we keep ours at a current level. Then that sort of thing would happen. If we use the carbon tax, if we do cap and trade, if we do something and they don't above what they're doing now, then the same sort of thing would be predicted to happen. Um, I'm not recommending, by the way, doing nothing. But the but part of the problem is it gives us less incentive to do something. In other words, if we do something and they don't, they gain short run economically. Yes. Why can't you change the economy into a creativity driven driven economy instead of a profit driven economy? We have economic democracy. You can change capitalism and communism into doing things right instead of doing things for profit and having narrow self interest as the only defining uh, mechanism. Now, our Buckminster Fuller wrote operating manual for Spaceship Earth, I don't know, 35 years ago, 45 years ago, uh, Utopia of Oblivion, and he outlined different ways of value creation that are dysfunctional that have only gotten worse. And, and when you're talking about wealth, wealth is only created if it's shared. Although part of the problem in the economics in the world today is we don't have correct value creation, and we don't understand what wealth really is. So you have these mechanisms of politics of scarcity that are creating shortages and creating this domino effect that are unnecessary. And we've had the mechanisms to cure this for 35, 40 years. And there has been so much vested interest uh, putting in uh, disincentives into the program, dis into the uh, system, disinformation, uh, keeping uh, you know the general public from the facts that need to be in their, their realm to make good decisions. We have a lot of different crises going on in the world right now. And they're all coming to a crux in the same way at the same point. And I think the value creation and, and, and the, the, the corruption that's going on is the fulcrum that we've got to get beyond to get past fossil fuels, to get past petrochemicals. And we have those mechanisms. We've had them for a long time. I mean, the, the oil companies have bought up 200 miles per gallon carburetors and put that technology away. You know, Paul McCready flew a you know, solar-powered airplane across or you know, a bicycle pedaled airplane across the English Channel, and they flew a solar powered plane, plane around the world, you had a solar powered, a powered uh, car drive across Australia, and yet you have governmental mechanisms that are allowing for these market protection, mon monopolistic and alcohol uh, mechanisms within the economy, and that's what's holding us back. I mean, underemployment is what's really going on in the world. People are not allowed to put their creative input into the economy. In your last point, um, James Hansen says more or less the same, that governments worldwide are subsidizing the oil industry, and that is distorting the economy, and actually encouraging extraction where, when and where it's really not. 
it's really not yes. profitable. Sorry, I will have to interrupt. I know it's such a fascinating discussion, and I wish we could go longer. But unfortunately, we will have to leave this room pretty soon. So we will have to bring this discussion to an end. But before we finish, I would just like to make a couple of announcements. The Scholarship Across Discipline is uh, hosting a few other events, panel discussions, and sabbatical conversations. You will be finding all this information in my queue. I would request all of you, all the faculty, all the students, to come and join us in our future events. And one very important announcement I would like to make is on Wednesday, March 6, Nobel laureate Dr. Yunus will be visiting us. He will be participating in two panels, one at 10 o'clock, one at 1 o'clock. And there will be a public address given by him at 7 o'clock at the Bird Khan Court. You are all invited to all these events, and especially to the 7 p.m. event. So anyway, I would like to thank all of you one more time, and please let us give another round of applause to our panelists.